So, um, hi everyone, my name is John. Uh, I'm joined by uh, David Gosley and OG Rose. Um, I'll start out this week by saying a few words about the essay. This week we read uh, essay three in Hayden, Hayden White's collection of uh, essays called Tropics of Discourse, Essays in Cultural Criticism. And it was called Historical Text as Literary Artifact. And uh, this is one example of where the title really gets to the meat of, I thought, what the essay was all about. Because in, in this essay, he's really trying to argue that what we have to look at pieces of history writing as are what he calls purely verbal artifacts. And that these pieces of history writing are uh, kind of, you know, always he's critiquing this sort of popular, naive, vulgar view of history that I think a lot of people have, where uh, history is just telling the facts as they are, right? Uh, and he says at the beginning on page 82 at the end of the first paragraph that these narratives of history are as much invented as they are found. So there's kind of Paley's watchmaker thing, uh, you know, walking across the shore and you look down and you see a watch and is it found? Was it made? Is it natural? I mean, what is its status? Uh, histories are as much invented as they are found and the forms of which have more in common with their counterparts in literature than they have with those in the sciences. Which is interesting that he draws that distinction because in earlier essays, he's tried to sort of deconstruct that distinction a little bit. But the whole purpose of the essay, I think, is to sort of ground history and history telling in the genres that we more associate with Western literature. Um, and I think that's a good starting off point. We can go into more detail later. Who wants to go next? Thank you, John. It's, uh... Once again, it's really great to be here with you, John and Oji Rose. Uh, let me reformulate that, maybe say in a different way, because even if we agree with Hayden White, we still have a question about reconciling these two aspects of historical writing, historical scholarship, historical accounts. How should we reconcile the fact that the historical, historical account includes at the same time construction and uh, an attention to evidence. How are those two things fitting together? So what, how, how should we, in our mind, in our, in our understanding of history as a discipline, history as an activity, combine the, the fact that history is constructed, historical account is constructed, and it is based on evidence, facts, uh, observations, things that we can verify. So this is, I think, a difficult question. Even if we agree that those two aspects are there, it still remains for us to, to see how these two things are entangled because it, it is as uh, one of the people that uh, are discussed and cited in this chapter is New Northrop Fry and his anatomy of uh, criticism. And people like Fry, they distinguish fiction and history. So we are good at this di distinctions, making distinctions and then keeping things separate, keeping categories of writing and categories of scholarship separate from each other. It is, I think, difficult, and maybe you, you two might disagree with this, it is difficult for us to, once we have made distinctions, then see how things are synthesized together and how, how things are em emerging as a combination of these categories that we have distinguished. I can say well, more. Let me just yeah. ask yeah. one question, sure. and then you can move on. Mm. Devu, what do you think the average person, the, the, the person maybe who hasn't read this essay, would say, What what is the problem with history being a combination of these two things. What's mm -hmm. wrong with it having this sort of fictive element and this sort of um, raw history, data, facts, names, dates, places element? What, what's, well, what, why, why, why might we find that suspect? Mm -hmm. what's, uh, I think what we want to avoid is the two extremes. We want to avoid the extreme factual position that history is just objective uh, reporting objective facts that anybody can agree with if they just see it right. We want to avoid that extreme. On the other hand, we want to avoid the other extreme of pure construction, that history is just manufactured uh, statements of historians. And the challenge is to find that middle position of 
that those two between those two extremes. And those two extremes, I think, dismiss the one extreme based on objective reports. They dismiss this agreement, and any lack of consensus has to be that has to lead to the fighting and arguing. And the other extreme dismisses the the relationship between history and reality. I think that's that's the problem, finding that middle ground and avoiding those extremes. I don't know if that responded to your question, but. Yeah, I'll come back and I'll, I'll, I'll say Sounds something good. about that. Okay, Oji Rose, please. Well, again, gentlemen, it's always a pleasure. And, you know, it's so nice to read a book. There were all these phrases. I wrote down a bunch of notes from it. You know, he has that part where he says, um, the more we know about the past, the more difficult it is to generalize about it. I love that line. This great line on 89 where he said, um, like literature, history um, progresses by the production of classics. You know, not only does Mr. White, you know, argue that history should be a um, literary, he also has some literary skill himself. And I, I really appreciate that. There was one line I wanted to home in on on page 90 in my edition, uh, where he says, we do not live stories, even if we give our lives meaning by retrospectively casting them in the form of stories. That was such a provocative line because we tend to think of our lives as story, but the point he's making out of he's like, no, you don't really live stories. You live something closer. Um, John sent out a great article and there was a line in it from Paul Ricoeur where he says, the untold stories of our lives. I love that phrase because, you know, you wake up, you have breakfast, you, you know, cut the grass, you walk, and there's like your day consists of hundreds, if not thousands of points of facticity that you never talk about. And that would be a really bad story. But when someone asks you, like we said, um, I think last time, how, what did you do today? Then you give it a story, which then creates the impression that you live the story when really you're always just retrospectively casting it as a story, which I think is, is quite important because um, if in fact we can't even get a true, uh, this is something I just keep going back to, like a true full account, what I'll call a full account of our day, we shouldn't be so surprised that we can't give a full account um, of history. And the question that, and then the question that I kept coming back to as I read this, um, and I'd be curious what you gentlemen think of it. The moment you acknowledge that interpretation plays a role, which one must if they say history as a literary event, does it inherently become interdisciplinary? Like, do you automatically have an interdisciplinary phenomenon the moment you start saying interpretation is involved, right? Because once you say interpretation is involved, you get into the questions of how your mind works. You get into the question of your sociological background. You get into, um, the, like, a lot of different questions kind of come to the foreground, right? Like, because you also have to talk about, you know, okay, well, we're focusing on... Um, the winners of history, uh, is that a good thing to do? Maybe we need to do some more research to get into people that are not at the forefront, right? And then what was the, uh, the design of water? Maybe the lack of access to water had an impact on history. Well, that's going to be getting us in maybe science. Maybe the weather had a big impact on how things went. And then you want to kind of understand how the weather works and how people would respond to that. And, but the moment you say, no, 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 it's not interpretational. There's no interpretation. It's just history. Oh, well, okay, we can specialize. You know, we can just specialize on a set fact because there's something I've, and I, I've been thinking a lot about it that once you talk about interpretation, it becomes interdisciplinary more so. And it reminded me a lot about the problem in economics where we want to say economics is modeling. Uh, but, you know, in order to model, you have to assume certain things, you have to freeze a bunch of things, whereas classical, you know, more some classical ec economist thinkers understood that you couldn't make economics just math because you had questions of human motivation, you had questions of what people valued, and you got into um, philosophical concerns. So economics that became pure modeling, you couldn't quite do. There's a really good uh, economic historian who I like named uh, Dietrich McClowski, and she basically says at the point, she says the problem with um, economists is it's okay, you actually, you know, it's good to specialize in that you kind of want to focus, like if you mean by specialization, focus as opposed to exclusion. It depends on what you mean by the word. If you say, oh, I'm a specialist, meaning I exclude everything out, um, that's bad. But if you mean I focus, that's good. But you said, you know, not enough people specialize and still read widely. So he's like, focus, but you still need to read widely. And she says there tends to be a tendency in her field where once you do economics, you read economics and that's all you do. Uh, but if we take seriously this kind of principle that you're seeing in history, uh, that actually, no, it's, it's, uh, it's more like literature. And we all know that literature has a very strong interdisciplinary bent, right? I mean, you have characters, you have ideas, like literature is radically interdisciplinary. You can't even understand a book if you don't understand, like, what was Russia going through at the time of war and peace? What was the language? What was the culture like? What were people thinking? What were the ideas? There's a lot of interdisciplinary concerns. Well, if you say that history is also like literature, then it's in interdisciplinary, which then Oh my gosh. Well, then you, it's almost the moment you do that, you give up the possibility of getting a really, really solid understanding of history. And I think that's existential because we want, if indeed we want history to be the science of history, so it can shut down ideological debates 
like it's above ideology, which is white is saying, no, 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 it's even in the implotment, it's still embodying an ideology, but there's kind of this ideal of history having this ability to kind of end debates or in beyond ideological struggles. Um, well, we give that up once we kind of say it's in this interdisciplinary realm, uh, it doesn't have that power anymore. Also too, once we introduce that complexity, we're foregoing the power it will have to help us know our origin to help us know where we come from, to help us know who we actually are. And it seems like we don't wanna give that up. And that may be part of what's contributing to a refusal to see um, history in literary terms. So I was thinking a lot about interdisciplinary as, um, as in the indivisibility of interpretation from an interdisciplinary approach. Um, I'll go back to what Davud said um, a few minutes ago, trying to weigh out these two. I didn't really, read the essay as trying to, to weigh the two at all. I thought it was more of a, a realization, like calling us to realize that um, hi history is more than just that one bit, more than just that one piece of the scale, which is the raw facts part. That, that other part of the scale, it, it's not so much about balancing, just the fact that it exists in the first place because so many people, even professional historians, don't want to admit that there's any sort of fictive, you know, to, to use, uh, I guess, uh, Northrop Fry's word in his own word, element to what they're doing at all. Yeah, I didn't get the balance so much. It's just that he, he really wants to emphasize that part because so many people, I, I think, are just too ob oblivious to it. But, but I also, it's interesting <laughs> that we are so oblivious to it. Um, when, when you took your first, the first time you ever asked to write a major history essay, I don't know when that was, but just imagine it. Didn't you say to yourself, oh my God, there's a thousand things I could mention. How am I going to tell this story? That's, that's kind of in, in a question what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. there, there's questions of inclusion, questions of what you're going to exclude. And, and he talks about, um, let's see, um, he, talk, he talks about R.G. Collingwood's notion of constructive imagination. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the constructive imagination is aided by our emphasis or de-emphasis on uh, motific rep uh, repetition, characterization, variation, what we leave in, what we leave out, um, sort of the shape of the story we tell. It, it's that constructive imagination. The, those muscles take some, some flexing to, to, in order to come naturally and you know writing a paper even over something you're familiar with you know you could get up and maybe talk about is is to, <laughs> talking about something is not the same thing as writing it down and and telling a story and trying to make it cohere in a certain way um yeah i think that's what i would that's say. yeah that's great uh, actually hayden white i think has a little passage in this chapter on writing and he he talks he talks about when a teacher, when a, let's say teacher historian, is uh, trying to tell the st a student how to write, yes, the, the teacher That's what always made me think yeah, of it. right, right. The yes. teacher always ends up feeling like there are certain things frustrated. That I, can't, I can't really tell you because there are yes. there's a personal element of it that you have to figure out for yourself, and maybe it is even um, somewhat ineffable, which I think connects well to that idea of interdisciplinarity, or maybe even un being undisciplined. You have to. And by undisciplined, I mean there are certain parts of the work, certain parts of writing a piece of history that don't come from within that historical system, that discipline of doing historical scholarship. There's always things that you need that have to come from the wild outside, that undisciplined outside and to do the work. That your wild side or whatever human wildness you have has to be captured by this discipline, this discipline of his, um, historical studies. I also maybe... I could emphasize, not emphasize, but consider this. Uh, the, you, you mentioned, John, the word balance. And this might need to be replaced with something else, something that doesn't suggest uh, balancing physical metaphor. Maybe we could also use a maybe chemical metaphor. We don't want to say that we are balancing fact-based history with interpretive history. We might also say that these two are con contaminating each other, that there's an issue of contamination. Like we, we can't have a pure fact-based account and we can't have pure interpretation, which is like pure application of interpretive methods without anything that they are being applied to. So these mm -hmm. two are, they're always uh, 
in, in, in frame each other or contaminate each other. Another uh, example that I had in mind was looking at the skies and looking at the, the clouds. And sometimes we see faces in the clouds. And that seeing faces or seeing houses in, in the clouds, it's, a, it's an instance of projection. It's, a, it's an instance Herodolia. of... Right. Uh, we see things that aren't there. We detect things that aren't there. It, this is an application of our ability to detect patterns. But we can't say that when we are looking at a person's face, we are also just detecting something that is not there. In the case of a person's face, we are both applying our cognitive capacities and we are detecting something that is actually there. I think people who fall on the side of too much interpretation that it's all construction or it's all interpretation, they are focusing on cases that are akin to looking at the cloud and seeing faces in, in the clouds. Whereas you can also point to instances where a person is looking at faces, but because of a damage to a region of the brain that is responsible for or necessary for detecting faces, they can't report seeing faces. So it, yeah. then there's always that question. Sometimes the clouds actually do look like a face. Right. But, but the more <laughs> important question would be, was the face made for me to see it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there an intentionality behind the cloud? Did someone mm -hmm. put it there? Right. Or is this just happened to be some passing figure that I'm recognizing as something that's familiar to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And it, and it also, too, like, uh, you know, you're, if you thought that face in the clouds was your mother smiling upon you and she passed away and someone comes along, she's like, no, that wasn't your mother smile upon you. You know, it's existential, right? And you're really upset about it because you're like married to a certain interpretation. So the idea that you want an intention, you want a certain design in order to confirm yourself or to confirm what you took in, you can kind of get married there. And the more and more you start saying that there's an, there is a interpretational um, element to, to history, the more and more than people have to feel destabilized in whether, whatever historical narrative that they are using to support themselves. And, you know, if we grant, like, um, if we grant that Mr. White is correct uh, from the, the previous essays, uh, and I think he, I love the part where he has the letters, you know, he makes this order of letters that repeats and he says, okay, even if you have four historians who are using the same set of facts in the same order, the fact that they stress one, they stress the letter A versus the letter B versus the level C, that's going to change the effect of the historical narrative. I thought that was a really good part where he shows the capital letters, same sequence and everything. So, um, you know, once you kind of accept that there's an interpretational dimension, well, that's when then you have all the other interdisciplinary concerns that come in, which then widen the scope of things that you have to understand. Like Mr. Wright will talk about Freud and some of his like, like all psychoanalysis and all these different things. And the more things you have to know to keep a hold on that view you had of your mother smiling at you in the clowns, or it starts to fade away and you start to doubt it. And you wanna be like, no, no, I can know history. I can be a, I, I can know, I can have a hard grasp on that, grasp, um, grasp on my view. And I don't wanna give that up. Because the other thing, um, he had that part on 97 where he says something, um, where he says, uh, but the effects to distinguish between good and bad interpretations of historical events, such as the revolution, is not as easy as it might first appear. Um, because once you start saying there are interpretations of, say, the French Revolution or the American Revolution, how do you determine what is the good interpretation versus the bad interpretation? And you see, this reminds me of the dilemma, like, how do you actually determine if Tolstoy is better than Flaubert or if Tolstoy is better than Dostoevsky, right? What do most people do? They say, you know, I like Dostoevsky, right? I like Tolstoy. We all know that the more you do literature, though, that it, the judgment ultimately doesn't come down to just kind of simple metrics like what do you like? right? There's a certain ability that one gains when they're deeply embedded in literature to judge literary texts that you cannot get if you just read literature passively, right? Because if you do that, you just use the, uh, the metric of what do you like. The thing is that if we accept that history is literature, then there's a massive responsibility on us, on readers, on people of history to actually then cultivate that ability of judgment, right? Because if they don't, then they're just going to go with the history they like, which will just happen to ideologically confirm them, and they'll just stay there. There. And so that's also there's a responsibility that is put on people to develop that um, deeper ability to judge history on higher metrics than just I liked it. So that's the other danger I, I can see historians say it's like once you move beyond the fact based thing, once you say there's not a science of history, it's something more literary. Well, then we're at the mercy of average people to read the history and develop those higher judgmental abilities that you can go get, only get from literature when you do a lot of it. And what if people don't? What if they don't do a lot of it? And you know, it, it takes work, so they may not. Then you're going to have a fragmentation 
of history in service of ideology. But then if we grant that white is, if white is correct, that it's already in service of ideology, just in its implotment potentially, that, that's already happening. But that aside, you would almost have a worse fragmentation uh, that, that could happen if people don't get the, gain the responsibility to judge historical accounts beyond I like them. White talked about, I forget which essay it was in, it might've even been in the introduction, where he sort of historicizes, I think it may have, might've been the first essay where he historicizes this idea of historians themselves being very protective of their own field because in the 19th century, you have uh, historiographers like Michelet and uh, Jakob Burkhardt and others who try to treat the writing of history like it was a scientific enterprise and who um, largely convinced many of their colleagues in and outside of history. And now that we get to the 20th century and those assumptions of being you know, a hard or nearly hard history or being radically challenged, they are now sort of treating history as, uh, you know, their own little church with its magisterium and you cannot question the magisterium. And, you know, it's, uh, it's like, well, yeah, you can. Uh, it's, it's just like any other, you know, it's basically a humanity and which is again, to draw a sort of a, a facile distinction between humanities and sciences, but. Yeah, I think that's why a lot of <laughs> where, where he draws a lot of ire from other historians and um, uh, other other critics too, where he's he's just saying it's it's got this big interpretive element and we have to to reconcile ourselves with it. Uh, I wanted to um, to start out uh, with going back to so he introduced in the last essay this idea of implotment, and he continues it in this essay. Implotment is what we do with those raw facts of history, the sort of, um, it's that uh, faculty of constructive imagination, drawing from Collingwood again. It's, um, it's what our, our mind uniquely adds to the story. Um, it's what makes a narrative either in his sort of four, fourfold um, construction, which he goes into in meta history of what irony, comedy, drama, drama or um, satire. Um, and with implotment, he says that really, uh, implotment's really interesting in this essay because he says that it's really only with implotment that you can have explanations uh, because historical facts uh, and events by themselves have no intrinsically comic, uh, dramatic, ironic, satirical meaning. Um, he does make an interesting point that, you know, it would be perhaps a bit crude to think of JFK's assassination as comic, but I mean, that's, that's a, a one, you know, odd point. His point is that given a set of facts about a story you want to tell, there remains this structure this plot that you have to cast it in sort of like a die. And that before you cast that, 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 that die, you have no explanatory power. The, the facts are just sort of floating in the air, unconnected. And it is, it is in the mind of the, the historian that in how they cast those facts, again, through emphasis or de-emphasis, motific repetition, characterization, and variation, that we that we implot and therefore um, draw or, or co come to have explanations of events. And then I, this I thought was really interesting because um, it, what it really means is that uh, more than just implotment being more than a fundamental part of storytelling or, or any sort of narratological act, uh, implotment is inherently cognitive. Uh, when you implot something, you are also constructing a way to understand it. And I thought a psychologist would really have a lot of fun with that. That's great. Mr. Psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> great segue. You're getting better at uh, providing segues for each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, it is it's really useful to think about the raw data and then imposing or detecting implotments, different ways of plotting, finding narrative structures in the raw facts, relatively raw facts. Uh, the problem is that it doesn't happen like that. The, the stages are first, we see some 
un unrelated to each other set of facts, and then we impose some narrative uh, structure and, and plot myths. The problem is that usually we have this knee-jerk reaction. We already have implotted things, like how Ojiro said, uh, we already have this reaction of liking or disliking Tolstoy. We already have categorized a, a historical event as tragic or as satirical. The challenge is to recognize the, the cognitive element, as you said, John, the cognitive interpretive element, and then try to separate that cognitive element from the relatively independent, non-cognitive sides of the account and be able to maybe provide or see the possibility of re employment to employ the same set of facts in a different way, going from maybe a satirical account to a tragic account. And this is where uh, Hayden White's own link or metaphor of psychotherapy is, is relevant. He sees that something like this should happen in a, psycho, in a psychotherapeutic relationship between a therapist and a, and a person who has a very rigid employment of their own personal history. Maybe they have really bought into some kind of Oedipal complex narrative and the therapist or some, some other form of uh, narrative that has convinced them that my, my suffering or my, my unhappiness is causally determined by these family dynamic issues. So the therapist's task is to kind of loosen that relationship, loosen the relationship between that employment that the client or a patient has done and the raw facts and provide the opportunity for seeing those raw facts with fresh eyes, with fresh perspective, and then maybe re, re implot them in a different way. And again, plot here, uh, he discusses them in terms of a symbolic structure, where you have, let's say, a general structure of type of narrative you're working with. And once you're convinced of that, once you're entertaining that sim symbolic structure, then you will place facts within that structure. It's like, oh, this person could be the bad guy, or this person could be the, the hero or this could be the challenge for, for the hero. So that's the, the, importance of, the importance of having a narrative structure. Danny. You know, he, I, he had that great part where he said, um, you know, the problem, you know, he's talking when you have a, a patient who's have a trauma or something, the problem, uh, the problem is to get the patient to re implot his whole life history in such a way as to change the meaning of those events for him and their significance for the economy of the whole set of events that make up uh, his life. I think that's so lovely. And that, cause that exactly is um, healing. But then to go back, there's something about the once history is interpretationable, um, that's not a word, but give it, you know, I'm going to let that go. Um, then it's always possible for the history of, say, a nation or a people to be re implotted. And it may be re implotted in a way that the people in power don't like or that the majority don't like, but it's healing for other people. Or there's all, the ground underneath you can always shift, sometimes for better, but usually people, um, they get married to their take and they don't like to have it taken from them. So there's a healing element to the possibility of re implotment, but healing can actually threaten. You know, sometimes you get so married to your wounds or you get so married married to the, the, um, the, the way that you take things that you don't want to give it up. That's why it's so hard to give it up. And I can just see the life of the nation, the life of the city state, the life of the Republicans, the Democrats who are married to a certain history of themselves, not wanting it to be at risk of employment. I like what you were saying on explain. It, it made me think of the difference. I've been thinking a lot um, about the difference between explanation and address um, and how just because you have an ex explanation, if your, um, your son explains to you why the squash is all missing from the garden, that doesn't address the fact that he didn't water the garden like you told him to. You know, he gives you an explanation why it's not all there you know it's you go out and you don't see it on the vine is it yeah yeah but you haven't addressed the fact that it's not there because you uh you know didn't do what you're supposed to do um so likewise when you create um an explanation you're taking a set of random facts and you're putting them together um but the same act could be where you put facts together to address something you want them to address or to address yourself or to address some problem right so like for example you may want to put together the facts that make up the i keep using the uh, french revolution i guess uh, a lot of people do the you you um you can put together the facts of the french revolution to explain itself to itself or you can put the facts together to address a concern you have about the formation of government today. Um, so you putting, so and it made me think too, I, you know how we always, in philosophy, there's always the, um, the dilemma of the thing in itself, you know, Kant, how can you ever know the thing in itself? It's almost like we like to believe that we can explain an, a historic event to explain the historic event to itself, and then we can access it. Well, we should have known that we can't access the thing in itself, but there seems to be this sort of effort where we think if we explain the historical event correctly, we'll have a thing in of itself. The historical event will be explained to itself and we can access it. But as we know, we, um, we, we can't do that, but it's interesting. It always, I kind of have been associating to explain history, the historic event being explained to itself 
is what we're telling ourselves what we're doing it. We're having it explain itself to itself when we know from philosophy we can't access the thing in of itself. And yet we are kind of, it's almost like I was just thinking how we kind of make an exception um, here, but there might be some existential reasons, nationalistic reasons, political reasons we do that because we want history to just support us and what, whatever we want to support it. And we don't want it to be vulnerable to reimplantments that would take the ground out from underneath our feet. And then when you make a copy of that thing and mistake it for the real thing, and then you make a yeah. copy of that copy and mistake it for the real thing, oh, yeah. then you're like Plato's copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Uh, and then yeah. you're way down in the cave and you're never going to get out, right? Oh, yeah. um, I thought uh, one more, I guess the ultimate place of where he's trying to go with the essay, which he hints at in the title, is, um, I'll just read something. It's, it's somewhere in the last paragraph at the bottom of 85. How a given historical situation is to be configured depends on the historian's subtlety and matching up a specific plot structure with a set of historical events that he wishes to endow with a meaning of a particular kind. That endowing with a meaning of a particular kind goes back to implotment. And that, I guess, really begs the question, where do we get these kinds of implotment? We know that, presumably, going back to Kant, they our archetypes sort of in our collective psyche, you know, having been experienced to, or having been exposed to a, a large set of a particular culture and times, media, literature, um, art, uh, that all of these references are in our heads. Um, symbols, you know, we all know what, you know, an apple tree stands for if we see it in a novel or something, or a female character named Eve or something. You know, we I mean, sort of these things are, they're symbols for us and they're easier or harder to read, but it, it goes back to um, where these available implotments come from. And like I said, it's obviously something that the historian is imposing uh, on the story, or as, as Davud said, might have been uh, selected for us much earlier than we actually would have consciously thought. Uh, but in, in any case, where, where do those archetypes come from? And that's where he wants to ultimately say that they are basically literary genres. And that's where his, that, I think that's where he's ultimately going with the essay is that history is a collection of uh, literary genre writing. And I think I said this in the last conversation, you can even tell, I mean, he, he wants to emphasize this point by the fourfold set of names that he gives the kind of history writing. What is satire? Well, it's a Greco-Roman form of writing that tended to make fun of the upper crust, but then sort of, you know, had a, a, a renaissance in, in the early modern period, right? What are comedies and dramas? They're also staged things <laughs> that are more funny or more sad. Uh, uh, what's irony? Well, that's a, not so much a, a literary form, but it's something often found in literary forms. So he gives them names that really emphasize the point that he's going back to literature and that literary uh, forms and genre are really all about what history um, and implotment are and, and, and what connect them. There's a passage here uh, before I read it. Uh, I want to say that this reminded me of a short story by Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, in which he writes about Averroes or Ibn Rushd, the Muslim commentator on, on Aristotle. On in, the, in, in that, <laughs> in, in, yeah, in that Borges short story, he talks about, uh, he imagines Averroes trying to understand what Aristotle means by drama, because he, in his own culture, the apparently didn't have these categories of tragedy, comedy, because they didn't have the theatrical representation of it, which would later become literary forms. So there are certain things in Aristotle that he, he wouldn't be able to grasp, and he's trying to imaginatively grasp, make, make relations between his own lived experience and those categories that Aristotle is talking about. So these are resources, I would agree that these are cultural resources, literary resources that we have, and then we can use to make sense of facts of history. So this is the passage from page 85. All the historian needs to do to transform a tragic into a comic situation is to shift his point of view or change the scope of his perceptions. We only think of situations as tragic or comic because these concepts are part of our generally cultural and specifically literary heritage. 
So there's, on the one hand, there is a desire to endow a kind of meaning, tragic meaning. Maybe you want to motivate some kind of rebellious act in, uh, in the workers. There's a desire to, to do something with a historical account. And then there's also using resources that are available in, in our cultural heritages. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Go, going back to your earlier point about perhaps there being maybe, for lack of a better word, an ideological component of, of these of, of coming to conclusions about impl preferential implotments over others. If you think that, you know, you want to tell this story in a comic way instead of a tragic or an ironic way, that, that, that you've, you've come to that conclusion much earlier in your life, maybe as an undergraduate student or as a graduate student. Um, and it's only now that you're 50 years old and you're finally writing this book on this subject, but you didn't really make that conscious choice. You're, you're, you're the interpretation and reading that you've been doing around that historical event for the past 30 years sort of informed that choice for you. Hmm. Um, do you it, it's still the case, would you agree, that um, the choices of implotment that you have nevertheless reside in literary forms and genres? Yes. Okay. Yes, I would agree. I would agree. Okay. Uh, it's, I, it's, yeah. it's nevertheless interesting how you said about how Sometimes uh, I and I would certainly agree that that choice is sometimes much less conscious than we would like to think it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It could become more fine grained. I guess we could have a person who has more exposure to tragic literary forms. They would have, you know, sub subtypes of that of that form of storytelling. But in general, yeah, I think we inherit those and use them subconsciously. We don't need to be conscious to use them. Daniel. Well, and, and you see, I think it's just important to realize that even if history is always cast in a genre, it does not follow that therefore the substance of the historical account therefore has no truth to it. Like one of the big mistakes, and maybe this is why there's such a knee jerk often can be against Hayden White is we, we tend to say if we use that Kantian language again, that you have the thing of itself and you have the thing to us, you know, phenomenon, noumenon, um, although noumenon is technically just a limiting principle, there's not a world of forms, but anyway, just we'll just use that language. If we, um, there's an assumption that if the moment you talk about the thing of itself or the history in of itself, to use that language, that there's a hard split between that and what it is to you. But actually you, you can't say for sure that your take on the entity has nothing to do with what it's actually like. Even if you can never access the cat in of itself, it does not follow that your take on the cat literally has nothing to do with what the cat may theoretically be in its actuality. The, the idea of the thing of itself is more of saying you can't be certain, but it would actually, if you were to turn around and say that your take of the thing has nothing to do with the actuality, well, how do you know that? Like, where'd you get that certainty from? You'd have to cross the noumenon to know that your uh, take of the phenomenon has nothing to do with what's across the noumenon. So likewise, um, even if it's the case, that we can never get to the history and of itself, that it's always going to be through modes of appointment. Um, that does not mean that therefore history is merely literary. There, it is always going to be to us. And there, you know, the, the question I think I like what John was posing is why do we use these employments, these, these forms of employment? Is there something ontological to them? Is irony somehow have this ontological basis in reality where, you know, we understand there's something about life that is ultimately ironic. So it becomes a very popular genre, not because some critics said so, but because we have experience and it has something to do with the human condition itself, which by the way, if in fact these genres do have, um, you know, some ontological basis, not just um, are created out of thin air basis, if you will, then all the more reason that the framing of a, of a historical narrative in one of them would have something to do with history and of itself across the noumenon per se, all the more reason to think that our accounts could be, could be accurate. So this is, I think, uh, again, to, to just stress, um, uh, and so it is interesting, I'm not sure, maybe these genres are kind of ontological or based in some sort of, I guess, what, Jungian archetypical uh, collective consciousness or something like that, it'd be interesting to explore. Uh, but again, Everything that's being said about history as literary is only a problem if you have a very hard break between the phenomenon and the thing of itself. Uh, if you don't have that, if you understand that your take of something could have something to do with the actuality, okay, well then it's not, it's not nihilistic. It's not a epistemic nihilistic situation. 
uh, in fact, if we accept, like, what does he say at the end? He's like, hey, in my view, history as a uh, discipline is in bad shape because it's out of um, touch with its origins in the literary ima imagination. Um, in trying to appear scientific and objective, it has repressed and denied to itself its own greatest source of strength and renewal. So in fact, embracing the uh, phenomenological or the subjective or what have you take on history might be what makes it alive again and lead to that sort of historical renaissance that we were saying last time. So basically, we just have to understand that just because we can't get to the, the history in of itself, it does not follow that therefore all accounts have nothing to do with the history in of itself. And one of his, <clears throat> one of his very rare, uh, they seem to be increasingly common, I'm glad to say, um, moments of lucidity towards the end of the essay. He says that uh, the criticism that history has a fictive element, this interpretive element, is only, only has any feet, only has any power if you think that novels have nothing to tell us. Yes, yes. And if, if you really want to take that line, I mean, well, good luck walking into a, a symposium of historians and because I don't even think the most hardline, you know, positivistic uh, historians would say that, right? I'm, I mean, most intelligent people will tell you that you can learn something from the great novelists. And um, if, if you can, then really this, this criticism is no longer a criticism. I wanted to say something. I had, I had an amazing English teacher in 11th grade she made us read, uh, what is that book by Joseph Campbell? Is it The Power of Symbols? The, the Power of Ideas? Of it could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. It might have been, it might have been that one too. And she made us read, um, so we read The Odyssey and then something else. And we also watched um, Star Wars, the original 1977 one. And she said, I don't want you to really focus on the individual acts of what's going on. I want you to sort of zoom out and look look at the arc of the story. Like look at the, the, the hero leaving home, engaging in adventures, um, facing death, maybe meeting the death of a friend or something or, or, or near death of a friend. And at the very end, returning back home. And, and it was my first introduction to the idea that maybe every story isn't wholly original, that there are shapes, that there are archetypes to story, and you mentioned Jung, perfect tie-in, right? Uh, that, that there are larger shapes to, um, and things that, that really um, ring true to people who have particular cultural or social backgrounds, and that sort of give you that warm, fuzzy feeling that you get when you get to the end of the Odyssey or, or, or Star Wars that the hero has made it back home and that's where he really belongs, you know? And I, I thought a little bit about Joseph Campbell. Um, of course, he doesn't really go into genre. He talks about that one big archetype of a story arc, but um, the fact that it's archetypical or archetypal um, made me think about him. Well, the very fact that the hero's journey appears and manifests in, in so many different cultures in so many different ways would give you reason to think certainty, you know, basically we have to get our head that certainty is possible, you know, um, possible, you can't have certainty about much, but you can't have a lot of confidence, confidence is very possible. Um, the, the fact that the hero's journey shows up so much would give one reason to think that there is something I'm going to just say ontological about the hero's journey, that there's something deeper, there's something about the nature of life itself that somehow reflects the hero's journey. So therefore, if you use, if you tell a historical account, if you see reason to tell a historical account in terms of the hero's journey, um, the fact that you use the hero's journey, say, oh, it's literary, therefore it's no good. No, 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 the, if, it, if there's an ontological basis for the hero's journey, that, there's good reason to think that that's exactly the right way to tell the historical account. That's a good way to tell the historical account. In fact, that may be one of the few ways, maybe perhaps there's something about, if we use the um, language of archetype, um, archetype, maybe there's something about the archetype that is crossing the noumenon toward us, even if we ourselves cannot cross the noumenon, like sending a message in a bottle across the ocean or something. Maybe that's it, what's it going feels, on. Uh, it feels sometimes when, when you, when you uh, read one of these stories that's, that really matches uh, Campbell's sort of model, that it feels realer than real. Yeah, you know? right. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's okay. like, it's not just you're reading a story, but you're, 
I don't know. It's it's so hard to put into words. Well, and I've heard the criticism that there's a self-selection bias that, you know, people are self-selecting the data, but you did that before you heard of Joseph Campbell. You had that magical feeling when you didn't even have the language of the hero's journey. So to say it's just self-selection, like I've heard, like you're selecting the evidence, I I don't quite buy. There's something deeper that's going on. And if you're using genres that connect with that depth to organize and discuss historical events, Maybe it's a message in the ball across the Numenon, you know, that it, it, it may be a deeper way to, 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 to actually get what life's about. Mm-hmm. That, that experience of or feeling of re- this is realer than real, it could be a result of you know, one factor could be that we are feeling the resonance. Of Maybe it was the PC past I stories. <laughs> it may, could be the resonance of a thousand similar narratives that in the, in the back of our mind is operating. But this, uh, this whole discussion leads us to, I think, questions that are interesting that could only arise from these recognitions. One of them is, so what is it that counts as literary innovation? And this ties into that really great uh, line in this chapter by White, that just like literature, history progresses with the appearance of a classic. So it is with the classics that yeah, Daniel mentioned this, this line before at the beginning. So what is the innovation if we are working with narrative archetypes or types of employment? What is it that creates an innovative move in the history of literature or history, history of history, meta history? Uh, and what are these classics and why is it that they count as pro- progress? So we, could, we don't have to address these questions now. We can maybe think about them for, for future sessions. Well, I, th- I think, uh, oh, did you want to say something? Go ahead. No, please, John, please, please. Well, he says, he says something in here about history and the novel or classic, I forget which word he uses, that they progress work by work, novel by novel, book of history by book of history. And that one of the real differences between the hard sciences, quote unquote, and the humanities is that sometimes science progresses in radical ways. Um, going back to sort of Thomas Kuhn's idea of revolutionary science versus normal science. Normal science is a slow accretion of data onto models that we already accept that we think best understand a particular phenomenon, whereas revolutionary science is something like um, uh, Einstein's correction of Newton, for example, or uh, quantum mechanics connect a correction of statistical thermodynamics at the beginning of the 20th century, where you have this gigantic leap and there isn't much room, <laughs> there's just a, a completely new model. And it turns out that this new model has a lot more explanatory power than the old model does. But um, it's, it's, it's interesting to talk about uh, his, historicizing both of them uh, in a way that Thomas Kuhn historicizes, historicizes them in, um, in his book, because these, these are much more incremental. You know, if you want to look at the history of satire or 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 any literary phenomenon i mean it's 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 got a long long history where sometimes science just makes really abrupt jumps you know so you don't really have paradigm shifts in literature because now my mind goes to something like ulysses the wasteland you know these different the uh the the reservoir and and it's almost like well even in ulysses right i mean he's james joyce is employing um you know methods where he's trying to put in the episodes of the odyssey you know, is that really a paradigm shift or is it just harking back and collecting together a lot of little devices that literary devices that have been used throughout literature? I think that's a very interesting um, point, um, John, because then it brings to the question that then maybe literary genres are more reliable because if you don't have these massive paradigm shifts that breaks, um, you go through history, you don't see these hard breaks away from them. It's almost like they're more tested. It's almost like there's more reason to think they are reliable and therefore it would be safer to use them as implotments for history. Whereas if we try to say use, you know, um, Newton to understand all, uh, or Aristotle to go even back further, uh, to understand all of science, that's really risky precisely because we have a history of paradigm shifts. It's like, ah, you know, you know, right now in theory, but now everyone's like, I don't know about this M theory, the string theory may not be good. And then, you know, 10 years people will be like, no, it's awesome. You have these fights, but that's it. Cause it's almost like if you don't have so many paradigm shifts in literature, maybe you have these great works, but not really paradigm shifts. That's very interesting, John. Then that would actually potentially make the use of genres more reliable. They would actually- as, a, as not a to say that they don't ever change. Sure. Right, but they just change so slowly 
that over yeah. a generation or two, you hardly notice it, but over 500 years, it's probably noticeable. Yeah. Oh, yeah, abso absolutely. But that's almost where they the very fact that they, they have incremental change gives you reason to think that when there are shifts, they're probably good shifts. They're probably shifts that there was a lot of testing and it was like, well, actually, we needed to make that little shift and to go in that. So it becomes reliable. So the whole process becomes more. Reliable. Well, that's so interesting, too, John, because we tend to associate science generally with something more reliable, something more concrete. When you're trying to understand the world in terms of science, that's that's safer. But actually, you have a history of paradigm shift where it's like, no, nah, it's not that Newton was wrong. He was just incomplete, but he was incomplete in very critical ways, whereas <laughs> it's almost like genres are more reliable, actually, is where they have an archetypal history. So, so the fact that White is using literary genres is almost safer than, say, if he were using scientific paradigms. That's kind of an interesting thought. I want to write on that now. <laughs> yeah. I look cool. forward to your lecture. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well sticky notes, you. shall we conclude uh, our discussion for this episode? Yeah. Any final words, thoughts? I think well, I'm good. Well, thank you again, and thanks to anybody who stayed with us this far. And uh, looking forward weeks. to yeah, see you in two weeks. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>